Well, thank you so much, Steve. Thank you so much, praise team. So glad you were here. I do not take it for granted that you come, and I'm grateful for your presence tonight. The book of Hebrews, chapter 6, the book of Hebrews, chapter 6, as hard as it is to believe, over the next couple of weeks, we will reach the halfway point in our study in this great book. It seems like just a flash to me uh, that all of a sudden we are in chapter 6 and uh, next week headed on toward the middle part of that and the halfway mark of this uh, magnificent book. Hebrews chapter 6, uh, beginning with verse 4, the writer says, For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted of the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put Him to open shame. For ground that drinks the rain, which often falls on it and produces vegetation useful to those for whose sake it is also tilled, receives a blessing from God. But if it yields thorns and thistles, it is worthless and close to being cursed, and it ends up being burned. You may be seated. Verses 4 through 6 of Hebrews 4 comprise what may be for many Christians one of, if not the most controversial passage in the Bible. Now there are a couple of reasons behind this interpretive dilemma. The first is connected to one's basic overriding theological Viewpoint. People develop their uh, theology and then they use that theology to interpret the Bible in the various places. Uh, and in fact, uh, if the Bible is going to be interpreted correctly at all, then it has to be interpreted according to their basic overriding theology. Now, there are those who believe that a person uh, who becomes a Christian can subsequently lose his or her salvation. In other words, no one can be absolutely secure about kingdom membership. Said another way, membership in the kingdom can be lost anywhere along the way at any time. Now we will call this group the insecure group. They never have confidence about their status with God. This group, the insecure group, then collides with those who hold to the thinking that no genuine believer can possibly lose his or her kingdom membership. Said another way, once saved, always saved. Now we will call this the secure Group. Now, as many of you may or may not know, these two groups, the insecure group, the secure group, have been battling it out for a very long time with no end in sight. Now, sometimes the two sides sort of put themselves out there as children as they get into repeated uh, is to, is not arguments with neither side convincing the other, but only causing the gap to grow wider. Well, quite frankly, a surface perusal of this passage seems to come down on the side of the insecure group. Let's look at it again. It is impossible, the writer says, in the case of those who have once been enlightened, and have tasted of the heavenly gift, and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance. 
Now, that's a quick surface reading. And unfortunately, most people rarely, if ever, get below low the surface, including both the insecure group as well as the secure group. Now, there is one inconsistency that I'd like to highlight regarding the insecure group. Those who accept the idea of insecurity regarding kingdom membership also believe that a person can be saved over and over and over again. So that he or she is constantly falling in and out of kingdom membership. One day you're saved. The next day you're not. One day you're in. The next day you're out. Now one has to hope that he or she dies on one of the end days... And not on one of the out days. I can only imagine the excruciating pressure that that places on the emotions of those who hold to this overriding theological view. And if it's me, I'm going to get saved every day. In fact, if it's me, I'm probably going to get saved every day, several times every day. Just to make sure that should the time moment come, that I'm where I need to be. Now, let me show you the inconsistency in this passage of Scripture. Look again at verses 4 through 6. It is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance. Now, let's take out everything between the first phrase in verse 4 and the last phrase in verse 6. It is impossible to restore them again to repentance. Now, let's say it like this. If you had it, look at the bottom of that slide. If you had it, then you lost it. You cannot get it back ever. Now, that's quite a dilemma, isn't it? If Jesus cannot hold on to us with an ever firm grip, then no one among us will be able to hold on to him with an ever firm grip. So if Hebrews 6 is used to say that a person can lose it, then we are also compelled to say that Hebrews 6 unequivocally sets forth the idea that when a person loses it, he or she loses it forever. There is no wandering in and wandering out. If falling away in verse 6 means losing it, then falling away also must mean never getting it back. So there is the insecure group and there is the secure group. There is also... A third group that has to uh, deal with restoration to repentance being an impossibility. We, the secure group, have to deal with that. We'll get back to that in just a little while. So let's look at a third group. We will refer to these people as the mixed group. So we have the insecure group. We have the secure group. And then we have the mixed group. The mixed group identifies the original recipients of this letter as a congregation that consisted of a blended group of Jews and Gentiles. Some of these Jews and some of these Gentiles had trusted Christ for salvation, for kingdom membership, 
but others had not. They were worshiping. They were in and around a church family, but they had never invited Christ into their lives. Now, the thrust of the mixed group view is that an unsaved person mingling with a Christian congregation can catch something of the overflow of the Christian experience. So much so that he or she can actually, according to the mixed group view, comprehend or share to some degree in the believer's encounter with Christ. However, according to the mixed group view, verse 6 creates quite a dilemma for these pseudo-believers. In coming so close to Christianity that they actually saw the sights, heard the sounds, smelled the fragrances of the kingdom, so to speak, and yet turn away, they forfeit all future opportunity to accept Christ. My dad used to say that Judas kissed the door to heaven and then went to hell. Well, that, that's, that's kind of like this view. You're, you're around all the things of Christ, but you never make the decision to accept Christ into your life. Therefore, all future opportunity to accept Him is eventually forfeited. Now, here's the thinking. When a person has reached intimate proximity to Jesus and yet draws back. That is, when a person who has stood on the edge of the kingdom, has seen all there is to see, has heard all there is to hear, and felt all there is to feel, then God, or God may well withdraw the drawing and withdraw the drawing forever and today. For instance... In John 6, Jesus said, No one can come to me unless the Father draws him. In other words, you don't get saved anytime you want to. God and God alone draws a person to Jesus Christ. It follows then that unless God is drawing a person, that person cannot come to Jesus. It is only while God is drawing a person that the opportunity to come is present. In Isaiah 56, there is a corresponding verse. Seek the Lord, Isaiah wrote, while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Said another way, God cannot always be found, nor is He always available. So come to Him now, at least in terms of accepting His invitation to follow Him. You just don't inadvertently decide that you're going to get in on God's deal anytime you decide to. God has to draw you. God has to pull you. God has to woo you. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 said, Now is a favorable time. Behold, now is a day of salvation. When? Tomorrow? Next week? When? Now. Hebrews 3.15, we've looked at it a few weeks ago, says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when the Israelis provoked me. Now watch this. The person who rejects Christ after being privileged to sit in the front row, so to speak, also jettisons any hope for salvation in the future. However, a close examination of verses 4 and 5 reveal a huge difficulty with the mixed group view. Let me show you. 
The word translated enlightened in verse 4, in the case of those who have once been enlightened, could be rendered or rather refers to spiritual insight that had been given by God. The accompanying adverb once could be rendered once for all and depicts the permanent nature of the enlightenment. Verse 4 further states that they had tasted of the heavenly gift. The word translated tasted indicates a real and conscious enjoyment of God's blessing. In addition, the writer says that they had been made partakers of the Holy Spirit. The word translated partakers suggests the idea of sharing or participating. Verse 5 reveals that these first century believers had indeed enjoyed the nourishment of God's Word, that they had benefited from the advantages that come to the believer out of the heavenly realm. The point being made by the writer is that his readers had actually experienced genuine conversion that they had actually been saved and had come to know the reality of the Holy Spirit. The book of Hebrews was not designed for a mixed group of believers and unbelievers, but rather for men and women who had an authentic relationship with Jesus Christ. Now that being the case, are we then again faced with the frightening idea that a real Christian can lose his or her status with the Lord. Now, if that is true, then again, according to verse 6, a believer who slips into the realm of unbelief cannot possibly be saved again. This idea, of course, is foreign to most who espouse insecurity regarding salvation. That is, a person can be in and out of membership in the kingdom, according to them. This defeats that theological view. So what is going on in this paragraph? Do these verses blatantly contradict other pericopes of Scripture, such as Ephesians 2, 8, 9, which says, by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Notice the phrases, not of yourself, the gift of God, not a result of works, that no one may boast. Boast. Now, the Greek construction of the phrase, you have been saved, refers to an event that took place in the past. The results of that event comes forward into the present and then it extends into the future toward infinity. So we have been saved, we are being saved, we will be saved. Once you are saved, it is impossible to be unsaved. Now, if it depends on us, then yeah, I think we could be. Because I don't know about you, but this guy blows it all the time, and if you want to know how I blow it, forget it, Jack, I'm not having that conversation with you. Now, what I'm about to tell you explodes, it just explodes every myth about an intermittent status of kingdom membership as well as the meaning of these controversial verses in Hebrews 6 in actuality. And I want you to get this, and you need to write this down somewhere in the margins of your page around chapter 6. These verses do not address membership in the kingdom or how to become a member. Rather, these verses address service in the kingdom. 
This is not a book about how to come to Christ. It is a book about what we do, who we are, once we come to Christ. It is about service. Critical to a proper understanding of Hebrews is Israel's Exodus experience as depicted in the Pentateuch, especially the book of Numbers. As clearly revealed in our study of Hebrews 3, Israel lost not their position as God's seed, but they lost their privilege as God's servants. Yes, God banished them to a spiritual wilderness. But they were never thrust back into the slavery of Egypt. Not for a moment. They had been delivered from Egypt. However, the book of Hebrews is about the service that we give to God as his believers. We have been delivered. We have been saved. Now, what are we going to do with the salvation that God has given us? Israel never, in the Old Testament, lost their status as God's people. Instead, they lost their opportunity of service. And in fact, so egregious was this loss that nearly 800,000 of the ancient Israelites died in the wilderness. God said, I'm done with you. Your opportunity is over. Because they had tasted of the good word of God. They had tasted of the powers of the age to come. They had seen miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. And yet refused to believe God or trust him in order to conquer Canaan. And they got right up to the door of Canaan and God shut that door. And after the period of four decades, when somewhere around one third of them died, then God would bring in the next generation. If we were studying the book of Joshua, we would see how they had to prove themselves just like their predecessors did. Would they, the next generation, go into Canaan or would they not? If they had decided we're not going to trust God, we're not going to trust Joshua, then they too would have been turned back into the wilderness. You know, we, uh, God has all the time he wants to do whatever he wants to get done. We don't. You're going to get in on what God wants you to do, then you better get in on what God wants you to do. Because soon, it's all over. So in this passage, the writer of Hebrews warned his readers that they stood on the precipice, not of returning to a lost state, but of lapsing into an irreversible condition of uselessness as God's light to the nation. The writer seems to couch his warning in a snapshot picture of an event that occurred not only in the history of ancient Israel on which this book is founded, but also in the lives of other groups through the centuries of faithless, negligent children of God. And this is what he's trying to say. Look what happened to these other Christians. They had everything going on for them. They had accepted Jesus. They had received the Holy Spirit. They were being enriched by the Word of God. They were enjoying the advantages that come to the believer as a child of God. They had they had flung themselves into the river of world mission. They were being used by God to redeem the lost. But then something happened to them. Well, what happened? Verse 6 says... They fell away. Perhaps the best way to understand that is that they veered from the path. 
The Hebrew construction here refers to a past action that had become habitual. These people fell away, they stayed away. They stepped aside from God's plan and they stayed aside from God's plan. Have you ever uh, met someone who says, I used to attend church? How dumb are they? You used to attend? Yeah, I used to sing in the choir. Yeah, I used to go to Sunday morning Bible study. Yeah, I used to be a tither. I did this, I did that, but it's been years. What happened to you that you veered from the path? How did that take place? These people to whom the writer of Hebrews addressed fell away, stayed away. This was not a momentary refusal to fulfill their role in God's program of evangelism. It was a continuous refusal. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to share my faith. I'm not going to be available for the Lord to use me in reaching the outside world. I won't, I won't, I won't. As a result, according to verse 6, this other group, whether it be The ancient Israelis or some other group along the way reached a point where they forfeited the opportunity to be used by God. Do you see the difference between salvation and service? We can forfeit the opportunity to be used by God. God, because we just fool around for so long and God says, I'm tired of that. You're out. I'm going to sit you on the shelf. I'm not going to use you again. However, according to the testimony of the ancient Israelites, God still met their needs. They flew in breakfast every, uh, every morning. They had breakfast on the lawn and every evening God flew in supper. God even, even got water to flow out of a rock. Their sandals never wore out. Their clothes never wore out. And there are all kinds of people who say stuff like, oh, I know God got me through that surgery. Well, wonderful. But when is the last time God used your life to reach somebody for the kingdom? And they look at you like you're stupid. What? What? Use me to reach the kingdom. Look, I'm just satisfied with food on the table, clothes in the closet, and gas in the car. And there are a whole lot of folks who name the name of Jesus Christ who were just like that. The ancient Israelites may still have wanted to be used by God, as we learned in Numbers chapter 14, verses 39 through 45, but God refused to give them opportunity. Well, how many opportunities did He give them? Who knows the answer to that question? How many? Ten! Ten! Ten. Thank you. (laughs) Whenever I've got a biblical question, I just pick up the phone and call Dan. Ten! How many tests did they fail? Ten. Ten. Zero. Not on any occasion would they trust Moses. Not on any occasion would they trust God to do the impossible. And after ten failures, and remember the the number ten is the biblical number for a completed testimony or a finished cycle. After their tenth failure, God said, that's all I need to know. You're in the wilderness. And over the next 40 years, I'll be with you when you have surgery and I'll put food on your table, but there's no way I'm using you. These people are dull, boring believers. Because there's nothing going on in their lives. But just the same old, same old. Never accomplishing anything for God. And no amount of repentance with the ancient Israelites, regardless of how emotional and how sincere, could open the door of opportunity again. You don't believe it? Just jump into Numbers 14 and see. 
Oh, well, after the 10th failure, oh, we're, we, we know now we've been wrong. We're going up to conquer that little town. And Moses said, why are you going up? Have you lost your mind? God's not going to be with you. I'm not going to be with you. Joshua's not going to be with you. And the Ark of the Covenant is not going to be with you. Oh, but we're going anyway. Isn't it ironic that they were still obstinate? Even when God said, you're banished to the wilderness, they were still obstinate. And so they went up. And what happened? Well, they got their fannies wiped. Can, can I say that, Steve? <laughs> and I think about 36 of them got killed. They were put to flight. See, salvation is not the issue here. Service is the issue. And when people try to take this passage of Scripture and make it say something about security or insecurity of the believer, it doesn't have anything to do with that. And that's why they get it wrong. But they refuse to interpret the entire passage. They just take out this little snippet here and there and make it say what they wanted, to, wanted it to say. D did you know the same thing can happen today? I, I, I've seen it happen to churches. I've seen it happen to individuals. Listen to the words of Herschel Hobbes. And if you don't know who Herschel Hobbes is, when I was growing up and in my young adult life, he was the... Southern Baptist theologian of preference. I've got numerous of his books, but listen, listen to what Hobbes said. A given group of God's people, a church, or an individual Christian may so rebel against God's world mission as to lose the opportunity of being used in it. A given church through lack of evangelism sees that it is slowly dying so it decides that for self-preservation, it will change its ways only to find that it has reached the point of no return. One shall not trifle with his covenant relationship to God with respect to kingdom expansion. Now, perhaps we might ask a significant question at this juncture. Why such a harsh response from God for the neglect as his agents and ambassadors? Look at the last half of verse 6. It gives us the answer. Those who repeatedly fail to participate in kingdom expansion again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. Boy, now that's tough right there. Now get this. Neglecting our responsibilities in kingdom expansion is tantamount. I'm not saying this. The Word is saying it. It is tantamount to nailing Jesus to the cross once again. Note the comment of Herschel Hobbes one more time. Those who rebel against God's redemptive purpose join with those who crucify Jesus in open disgrace. He was crucified as a criminal, his naked body being made a spectacle of shame. They crucified Christ in rebellion against God. They sought to destroy Jesus, to negate God's purpose of the ages. That is exactly what Christians do when they refuse to be involved in God's program of evangelism and missions. The end result, insofar as their lives are concerned, as well as the lost souls to whom they do not witness, is to negate God's redemptive purpose. Thus, they join with the crucifiers. God's purpose goes on in another time and another place, but for the rebels, their opportunity is lost. Forever. Well, Connell, when does that happen? I'm going to give you my best doctoral answer. I don't know. 
It is whenever God says it's going to happen. It is whenever God says, I've had enough. Now I'm putting you over here and I'm going to raise up somebody who loves me and will do what I ask them to do. And I can tell you this, God knows when enough is enough. And every time we push him away, every time we refuse, we just add that to the closer proximity of when God says, I'm done with you. All right, let's take a moment to see what this means for Hall of Fame living. Are you ready? First, kingdom membership does not guarantee kingdom success. Just because you become a believer, it does not necessarily follow that you are going to be an immediate success. There are many people who become Christians and fail as often in the believer's life as they did before becoming a believer. Second, spiritual growth is essential. Now, if we were to just do a little round robin here tonight about what spiritual growth means, what would you say? Somebody just... Throw it out there. Yes, Mike? Going from a milk diet to a meat diet. Yeah, I love that keto, baby. <laughs> Eat meat. Yeah, P Peter talked about that. Paul talked about that. What else? So, so that, means, that means you're getting into the Word, right? Yeah, that means your understanding of the Word is growing, right? What, what else? Just, just throw it out there. Fruits of the Spirit. Fruits of the Spirit. There, there you go. Did, did you say that back there, Lord? Did you say fruits of the Spirit? Well, we got a couple of fruits over here, and they both spoke up at the same time. Going from meat to fruit. Well, fruit is not something we eat, spiritually speaking, it's something that we are. It is something that is demonstrated through our lives. What, what else? What does this mean? Obedience to the Holy Spirit. What a novel idea, Mr. Valsheen. Obeying the movement of the Spirit. Yeah, there you go. What else? Guarding the faith. Guarding the faith. Do, do you believe there are folks out there who want to rip up the faith and tear it down? If they were here, we'd throw them out. How come y'all aren't laughing at that? You think I do it, don't you? Yeah. Steve. Go out, and reap the harvest. Go out and reap the harvest. Praying for laborers. We talked about that a couple of Sundays ago. Mike, did you have another one? Who, who else? Yeah, very similar. I was going to say uh, planting seeds and watering seeds. Planting seeds, watering seeds. Yeah. yeah. All of these things are good. Now, I put down three things, and, and here's what they are. Go slow. Go slow. I do not have a slow gear, my dear. You know, but this is this is not going to be on the screen. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, okay. Are you ready? Are you ready? Yes. Trusting God. <laughs> is is that slow enough? <laughs> Yes. Trusting God to do the impossible. When is the last time God did the impossible in your life or in your church? When is the last time that you believed God more than the circumstances? Trusting God. Here's the second one. Are you ready? You got that pen ready to roll? Courageous actions. Well, look, you asked for it. Just giving it to you. My philosophy is no woman left behind. A sexist would say.
you know, when you're growing spiritually, you, you just, it's just hard to live with the mundane and the normal. You want to go after big stuff. It's courageous actions. When somebody says, you can't do that. Well, that's just like telling me. I've got to do it. D does that happen to any of you or is that just me? If you don't want me to do something, don't tell me I can't do it. Because that's the very thing I'm going to do. Here's the third thing. You ready? You ready? God's methodology. Now, there are a lot of O's in there, just like there are a lot of E's in DeBarta Laban. I bet you will do that again, Gail. I bet you will. Because you can't help it. You can't help it. You, ha you have to. And what is God's methodology? Are you listening to me? God's methodology is we act and then He provides. Now, what's our methodology? God provides and we act. Are you, are you getting bored there, Donna? I got three minutes. I'm going to be done. You believe that? You, you don't believe? No. Since you don't believe it, I'm going to have to do it. Third. Active service gives witness to kingdom importance. Look, if you're not doing anything in ministry of some sort, then you just let the world know you don't think the kingdom of God is very important. Well, I'm just older now. I can't do anything. Well, let me ask you something. Can you pray? Does your mouth work? Then you can pray. Let me tell you something. Pray for me. I need prayer more than anybody in this church. Amen. Ask Donna. <laughs> People who aren't doing anything, it's just not very important to them. Well, I, I saw something the other day on Facebook that said, church should be the reason you miss everything else, not everything else the reason you miss church. Is, it, is that how that goes? Yes. Fanatics. <laughs> Here's number four. Longevity leads to more and greater opportunities as well as increased effectiveness. There's something about being in for the long haul. I, I got two minutes according to that clock back there. The one that's on that wall. Last one. Whether a believer or an unbeliever respond now to the call of God on your life. This just may be the one time that we fail to respond and God says, okay, I'm done. Let's pray together. And I want you to notice that the prayer does not count as part of the sermon, so I have finished before 8 o'clock. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying, I, I got I to gotta get all the points I can here. Amen. All right, let's pray. Father, we, uh, boy, we just become so pathetic. We become lazy. We become people without energy, without purpose, without drive. We are in constant need of renewal and awakening and revival that we might get in and be a part 
of kingdom expansion. And we are so thankful for the many people who have put their trust and faith in Jesus Christ through this ministry. So many people who have been baptized in this baptistry. So many people whose lives have been changed. We are grateful. Lord, we do not want to step back in any sense of the situation. But we want to move forward being used by you to conquer new territory, so to speak. Through the Spirit, to pull down fortresses. To speak words of praise and adoration. To become, as we talked about Sunday, that walking, talking fountain of good news and joy. Well, we need some help. And we want to thank you for bringing it to us. And that, Lord, when we're all said and done, that we'll look back and see how many great and wonderful, unbelievable things you did. And we pray it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And we're...